Good morning, conference. That's rubbish. Good morning, conference. Oh, you are awake. Thank you. Good. Um, I hope you will be awake because we want this uh, session to be as interactive as possible. You have three ways to submit questions. One, by writing them down and giving them to one of the mic handlers, the volunteers on the edge, and they'll pass them up to me. Or you can just volunteer, put your hand up, and they'll come with a mic to you and let you ask a question. Or you can Twitter your uh, questions and we'll ask them off of the Twitter feed, which should be on display on one of the screens at some point soon. Um, the panel discussion this morning is evaluating and assessing CPD, Continuous Professional Development. And our pan panel members are Amo Padwad, who's a very familiar face these days, uh, Rod Belitho, who's a consultant from the UK, uh, from Nile, uh, Maya, uh, sorry, uh, Satuvali Mohanraj from EFLU, and Maya Menon from the Teacher Foundation. So to start off, first of all, let's clarify what exact, clarify some terms. What exactly is CPD? Uh, good morning, everyone. The question given to me is, what is CPD? I wonder if I should answer it directly. And this has been discussed in Alice in Wonderland by Louis Carroll when he talks with the, when he gives a dialogue between the Cheshire cat and Alice. Alice wants to know where, what place this road leads to and the Cheshire cat says it doesn't matter. And finally the dialogue ends with if one can go somewhere one has only to walk. That captures the essence of CPD. As teachers, we should be willing, we should have the desire to go, and we should know where to go. Now, this entire thing is captured in, the, in a small letter written by a boy to his father. I'll read that, which describes the present-day school situation, and leave you to infer what CPD is. This captures that. It captures how CPD is an organic matter. It has to be within us and it has to grow from within us. That's captured in this letter. Dear Papa, this is in answer to your letter about my transgression. Yes, my first rank slipped to the second. You advise that I should think before studying, before answering my papers. Yes, the operating word, think, did make me muse, and these are the results of those musings. Father, we have never really been close, and I can't rightly say you've been my friend, philosopher, guide, etc. Yes, I'd like you to be aware of my musing. They are very important to me. You are highly educated, and you provide for, well for the family. But in your departmental store, do you apply Pythagoras' theorem or Newton's law of gravity? For that matter, does your doctor friend or your lawyer brother? Papa, my grandfather speaks of a carefree and beautiful childhood, of days spent in plucking mangoes and guavas from the jameen, of uh, picnics on the banks of the river where the men cook mouth-watering food, playing marbles and gilly danda. From his talk, it seems studies were an ancillary subject and living and experiencing the major subject. Father, is he fibbing? Or is it possible that the world has turned topsy-turvy in just about 70 years? Papa, my grandmother is semi-literate, yet she is at peace with her pots and pans. Then, oh Papa, last week my rose plant almost died. Some pests. I asked my biology teacher what I should do to save it. And she was crass. She said, go ask the guy who keeps gardening things. <clears throat> he will tell you. We will learn about pesticides, but we do not know how to use them. Oh Father, it matters not to me why the apple does not fall 
upwards. Nor do I care what Archimedes did. What matters to me is that my rose plants remain healthy. When there is a fuse in my house, I should know, I should know to do something about it. I should know to make a desk for my carpenter's tools. Instead, I learn about hypotenuse relational square roots. Papa, once I asked Ryan mother how she got to be so wise. Do you know what she said? By living and experiencing. And she laughed as though I had asked something which was so obvious. Are we living, Papa? Anyway, Papa, do you know where I lost the quarter mark that brought, my fall, brought about my fall? It was a fill in the blanks question. I held that I was invited to tea. And my teacher was adamant and that he was invited far tea. A matter of grammar. And Papa, if he says George Bush is the president of India, it will be so. And if he says the sun rises in the west, so be it. And if he says the earth is flat, it will be, Papa, at least on my answer papers. My first rank is at stake, you see. Still, my dearest Papa, I shall keep your advice in mind and strive not to lose that quarter mark. This captures to me the present day situation. And if we can understand this, that has all the qualities that, make the, that become the components of CPD. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Amo, would you like to relate that directly to English language teaching, perhaps make it explicit what exactly uh, CPD is? Uh, yeah, uh, in my opinion, the key word in that whole phrase is development. And the moment we think of this word, we realize that it's a process, very complicated, complex, long-term, almost lifelong process. And it has got all its attendant challenges and difficulties, but also the moments of joy and inspiration. And it also has a key aspect of being personal, being individual, coming from our own inner urge. Uh, if we take all these things to relate to the professional word that's in the middle, then I think that summarizes. I become a teacher, I join the profession, but then how do I keep growing as a professional? That process summarizes uh, what we imply in the term CPD. Yeah, I think you said something um, very interesting yesterday in the coffee shop. If I am quoting my own tweet here, it says, uh, CPD is a personal process that thrives in a community. I thought that was a really important thing to say, that you make your own choices about how you're going to develop as a professional. You do something to improve your own practice and then share it with other people so that they can benefit from your experience and you can benefit from their insight. I think that was a, a very intelligent thing to say, Amo. <laughs> Rod, um, when we're talking about evaluating and assessing uh, CPD, what are the differences between them? What can you distinguish between assessing and evaluating? Yeah, just one more comment um, before I go into that difference, one more comment on the essence of CPD. I've been um, around teaching and training for more years than I care to remember. When I think back to the teacher I was at the start of my career, um, and I think about myself now, um, I know uh, that a lot has changed. Um, one of the interesting things about development, um, whether professional or personal, uh, is that some of it happens unconsciously. Um, it's not always a conscious process. Um, it can be conscious, but uh, very often it's, it's just something that happens. And if you compare yourself right now as teachers um, with the teacher you were at the start of your career, you'll notice differences, and you won't always be able to account for those differences. There are some turning points in our professional lives, um, but those turning points um, are easy to remember. Um, the processes that lead you to develop are not always so easy to capture. And that's a nice link to Alan's question to me, which is about um, the difference between assessment and evaluation. Um, 
One member of the um, audience, I hope she's here today, came up to me yesterday after the coffee shop and asked me very earnestly, what's the difference between assessment and evaluation? Um, and I said, do come to the panel discussion this morning because that's where we're going to reveal all. Well, here's all. <coughs> um, it's very, very difficult to be precise about this. Assessment and evaluation do overlap. They use their terms which are often used loosely um, but here's my shot at it. The word um, ev evaluation um, is somehow redolent of uh, an event. It's something which happens at a particular time, within a particular time frame. So uh, evaluation may take place at the end of a course, it may take place um, in the middle of a process of some kind, um, it may take place after a particular process has finished in order to um, evaluate the impact of that process much later on. Uh, whereas um, assessment for me collocates uh, with the word continuous. Um, it's a process and it's something which goes on um, right through. Uh, a, it's a parallel process to development, if you like. We're constantly assessing what we do. We're constantly assessing our uh, our development and um, like I say some of its conscious some of its unconscious so the best um, uh, distinction I can make here is between evaluation as an event and uh, assessment as a process uh, with very often um, an institutional dimension as well as um, an individual dimension and I'd like to return to that afterwards because I don't want to speak too much right now would anyone else like to comment on that are you happy with that as a, a framework for moving on? Maya? Okay. Um, so, so, let's say, Maya, um, we're coming to you next. So why do we need to either assess or evaluate CPD? What's the point of it? Yeah. Um, why do we need to assess or evaluate CPD, even if we were to use it synonymously, whether it's a continuous process or event? Uh, my whole contention is that CPD, is, while CPD is not in service training, of course, a lot of the times you, some, uh, in, in our country, especially in schools, especially with teachers, you need an external impetus to begin this whole lifelong, hopefully lifelong process of CPD. So often an effectively well-delivered in-service training can be the trigger for a more permanent uh, a lifetime journey of continuing professional development or continuous professional development. I think the absence of learner autonomy in India uh, uh, handicaps the teachers because teachers are past learners who have gone back into the school, school system and because of that they don't know how to take control of their lives and therefore they need that external impetus to begin this process and I think conferences like this definitely help. And in that context, I, we've often used Gusky's model of uh, the five levels of uh, evaluating impact of CPD um, in, in uh, some of our whole school improvement and whole school intervention work, which is, I won't go into the details of it, maybe later on I can. Uh, one is uh, taking participant reaction, uh, assessing uh, uh, CPD through participant reaction, which, which means uh, feedback from teachers, feedback from uh, f uh, other stakeholders in the school. It could be participant learning, assessing uh, participants' learning, teachers' learning before and after. Um, organizational support and change, what kind of su uh, support systems are put in place in the school because of CPD. Um, wh uh, what about participants' use of, and knowledge of knowledge and skills? And we do that through classroom observations. We observe the teachers before and after uh, a certain process. It may seem like it is, it is uh, part of a training process, but actually it's a far more holistic, uh, uh, integrated process, which is uh, a sustain, of a sustained nature. About, it, 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 it spans at least two to three years. And then finally, looking at pupil learning outcomes. So that's the model that uh, Gusky provides. Kirkpatrick's model is also not too different. So participant reaction, participants learning, uh, organizational support and change, participants' use of knowledge and skills, and pupils' learning outcomes. Uh, I can talk about each of these later. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, just to summarize that then, there, we've got four, I, I'm more familiar with Kirkpatrick, but this, um, you've added one more in there. So we've got reaction, which is the immediate reaction to whatever you're doing. What you learn from 
that event or that activity and then what action you take as a result of that learning. You can't take action until you've learned how to do it and you can't do it unless you enjoy what you've done. So in this conference, for example, you're filling out a feedback form. That's a reaction to the conference. Yeah. Hopefully, you will have learned something from the sessions that you've been in, but you're not going to take action on them until next week. Hopefully, we're going to take action next week. We'll come back to that later. Um, in this conference, at the moment, we can only, uh, we can only uh, really judge your reaction. If we did some in-depth interviews, we'd probably find out that you'd learned something. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have to interview you later to find out what actions you're taking. Um, oh, and the support system in the organization that you're working in needs to be in place before that action will succeed in the future. So, um, looking at... Does anybody want to add anything to what Maya said? Um, about the rationale for assessing and evaluation? I'd like to just uh, talk about how that, uh, that is CPD, because uh, a lot of the times you could misunderstand it for just getting feedback about an in-service program. Mm. It, is, it is CPD because it is holistic. And in fact, um, research from uh, Goodall, uh, Day et al., they talk about that the ultimate purpose of CPD must be changing practice in the classroom uh, with a view to improving student learning, either directly or in indirectly. If you look at it in that way, it, uh, a, ho a holistic approach to whole school improvement, taking into account all these levels, can contribute to CPD and can trigger off CPD. And we have found that getting participant reaction on any pro uh, programs that, uh, that are need-based, which they have undergone, helps them articulate how can they actually take it back into the classroom. And for the average teacher in, in, in India particularly, but maybe in South Asia also, the articulation is important for them to understand and to be conscious about what is it that they can take back into the classroom. Without the articulation, there isn't that awareness. And I think awareness is all, uh, CPD is all about self-awareness. Just to, just to add to what Maya has said, I just thought CPD is much more organic, means it is self-initiated. It's as natural as growth. A child cannot wish away and not grow at all exactly like that but it's a gradual and an inevitable process the only thing that we need to do is or the only thing that we can do is we can give it a direction by being conscious of the type of development that happens in us by reflecting on what type of development is happening it's possible for us to give it a direction and achieve our goals and that that's what cpd is to me uh, sure, just I'm okay. Add a little point. I think uh, we can spend a moment thinking about the word inevitable. I agree it's organic and it's a gradual process. But then, is CPD inevitable? And if it is, do we need conferences and seminars and teacher education programs? Um, just to add to that, I, I also uh, don't think it's inevitable. Um, Michael Fullan, a very famous quote in his book, uh, Change Forces, he, uh, he says that change out there is inevitable, um, growth is optional. So how you respond to change is all about um, you know, decisions that you take in the face of change. Um, change innovation can be an opportunity for development, but you don't always take it. You may not be ready to take that opportunity. Um, so I agree that it's not inevitable. Development is not inevitable. I've just been checking the audience to see if anybody wants to ask a question at this point. We are going to move on to specifics soon, but if anybody wants to ask a question about the background, we've got Adrian over there, and we've got a question down the front here, please, after that. Yes, you mentioned, or you said, um, it's a gradual <coughs> and inevitable process, and I'm wondering whether CPD necessarily is always gradual whether there can be a sudden change almost a revolutionary change that takes place on occasions I just think that um, sudden change often results uh, in um, sudden uh, backsliding later on um, 
very often, um, you know, when you're working with teachers, there are people who um, have this light bulb moment when they suddenly say, oh, I'm going to do everything that you talked about. I'm going to do it in my class. Um, but actually, uh, they discover when they do it in their class that um, it doesn't work for them. Um, and they go back to what they were doing before. I'm always a bit worried by sudden change, um, by revolution instead of evolution. And the word that goes best with development for me um, is evolution, not revolution. Mm. Yeah, and probably in addition to that, the word continuous might also give us an impression that it's a smooth process, which it isn't. So there are likely to be patches of high activity and patches of uh, absolute rest, mm. bursts and cycles and ups and downs. But it is a process of evolution, I mm. agree with Rod. Going back to the origin of species though, evolution doesn't just happen as a smooth increasing curve. It often, uh, it often does jump yeah. at certain points, but that depends on what's been learned and what has, has happened before it. And it depends on the opportunity for that jump to happen, to be in the right environment um, for uh, that big leaps in evolution to take place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to counter what uh, Rod and Amul said because sometimes it is possible that growth can happen when there's a sudden jump. Mutations happen in, in, in the natural world in the same way. Sometimes that external impetus or sudden change in policy, out, out, you know, external policy or state policy mm. can result in a burst of uh, mm. hopefully growth. Yes, uh, there was a question down the front. Yeah, I agree that uh, this is uh, growth will be organic and natural, but the thing is that the key thing is the willingness on the part of the person. Now, I, I think uh, the professional or the teacher is just like a plant. Okay, all the necessary components are like uh, air, water and all other things are there. Otherwise, let us say that he, is, uh, he gets the books or again, he is exposed to various training programs and all. And it's, oh, it happens, but the thing is that unless and until there is willingness and motivation on the part of the person, that is very, very essential there. Because we see that for many courses the teachers are being sponsored and all. But they simply attend it and then they come back and they don't implement it. But what is necessary is the willingness and motivation on the part of the person, I think. Thank you, sir. Um, there's one over here. Uh, we take uh, CPT as a very continuous process. But uh, if we look into academic staff colleges in, uh, uh, in the country, like India, uh, we have a continuous feedback system and we have been assessing, we are filling up forms and we are taking the uh, um, feedback from the participants. But uh, actually, uh, I don't know what, <coughs> what, what next and who is to take uh, an action of the evaluation of the teachers and the course, maybe, or uh, maybe uh, the outcome of a particular event, mm -hmm. teaching learning event or a production or maybe a kind of uh, teaching learning uh, uh, scenario mm -hmm. and what is the end product that we are considering mm -hmm. and it differs uh, from one particular uh, specific uh, teaching learning scenario to another particular teaching learning scenario. So I don't know whether it is uh, there can be a holistic model for it. I leave it open to the uh, panel, okay. to can anyone to comment on it. Can we take a few questions first and then get you to respond to them? Because there's quite a few people wanting to ask questions. Also, that leads us nicely into the next area that we were going to talk about anyway, which is um, what should be assessed and evaluated? What are we looking at exactly when we're talking about uh, assessment and evaluation practices? So uh, there was a lady here first. I wonder, uh, are we make, creating the impression that uh, CPD is a very easy process because uh, it is a personal process and uh, there, there is a rigor that is involved. Uh, there is a lot of hard work that is involved. And are we creating the impression that by saying it's organic that it happens very easily? Uh, mm. Thank you. I don't think anybody's suggesting that. There's a gentleman in the middle. Thank you. Uh, I'm K. Srinvastra, a student professor in uh, NRI Institute of Technology and Sciences in uh, Vijayawada. 
uh, I'm very happy to listen these words, uh, the rechargeable words, direction, aim, changing, and growth. And definitely uh, having uh, these words in our mind, and we can recharge for further growth, and we can have a vision. But my question is, uh, how do we visualize the English teachers in coming five years? Okay, we'll come back to that one later. That's a big question. We have a, a gentleman over at the end, and we've got one question here, and then we're going to move on and get some answers, okay? So hold your questions for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raj Gopal here. We have so far been discussing continuous professional development. Now, C is okay. Continuous continuity is perfectly all right. D development is okay. No, no questions about that with what the panelists have said so far. But I'm looking at the word professional. To me, in the context of this seminar, which looks at the training of teachers, a teacher's professional development has still not been defined. You know, the professional development of a teacher. First and foremost, I would like you to take up the definition of professional. Okay, thank you. We'll, do, we'll be discussing that and then later on. Excellent, thank you. And the last question for this um, period at the moment? I would say that uh, CPD is inevitable, Mr. Bob, because the uh, educational scenario is changing so much and if a teacher is not up to date, she's going to be floundering in what she's going to, how she's going to deal with the children in the class. Like, uh, for instance, we have mind maps, we have uh, transactional analysis, multiple intelligences, all those things were not there a few years back. And when uh, I had uh, had an exposure uh, about it uh, in the international schools where I'd worked, and when I brought it down south, uh, people were just wondering, these are such new things. So that way we need to go professionally, we need to know what is the latest in the field of education. And uh, educationworld.com, I just see they are one of the sponsors, their schoolnotes.com is so wonderful. It's such a good tool for the teachers, anybody who is aspiring to do anything new for their children. Definitely these are things which we need to do as part of our CPD. That's what I wanted to say. Let's do something odd and start with the last one first. CPD is inevitable. Discuss. We, we already uh, said something about this, but I'm prepared to come back on it simply um, in order to... Um, it's, I think uh, I'd, I'd like to blend the answer to two or three questions that have come up. Uh, where will we be in five years' time, uh, English teachers? Uh, what is professional all about, Mr. Rajgopal? And this last one, um, inevitable. Um, I think the, uh, the institution, the school, is only as good as the teachers that work in it. Um, so uh, in order to have a developing institution, you need to have developing teachers. This much is absolutely clear to me. And the interests of an institution which is far-sighted, um, which is looking ahead five years, which has a five-year plan, uh, are served by teachers that are actually developing. So it behoves the institution to have a policy on professional development, an actual policy on professional development. This is something which can be evaluated after five years. If the institution says, um, we are prepared to invest in the professional development of our teachers by sending them on courses, by letting them go to conferences, by encouraging them to publish, by offering them opportunities to observe each other in classrooms, by um, making sure that teachers who are having difficulty are being supported by the institution, by making sure that there is dialogue between teachers, parents, children, um, the leaders, the managers in the institution. This is what I understand by a developing institution. A developing institution is only as good as the people, the live people who are in that institution. And in five years' time, if there is a real policy, a real investment in professional development, then there is going to be progress within the institution as a whole. And um, Mr. Raj Gopal, uh, that for me is the P 
that's the professional in professional development. It's the, um, it's the institution taking control, uh, making it possible for individuals uh, to tread on different development paths by uh, facilitating this and not stopping teachers. So when a head of department gets a request from a teacher, um, can I go on a course? Can I go to a conference? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I observe a colleague? Um, the head of department should be saying, yes, I will make that possible. Not saying, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do to substitute you if you go away. That's what professional development at institutional level is all about. That's what institutions need to do in order to foster a developmental culture. And that's where the P for professional comes in. Thanks. I just want to add to what Rod said, uh, giving, citing an example from, um, from my own organization, the Teacher Foundation. We have some teachers who are attending a course and they choose to attend, they pay for it themselves. And two of them are from a particular school in Bangalore and they said, please do not tell our principal that we are undertaking this course. The thing is that for this course, they, we actually have to go into the classrooms in their school to observe. They said, no, no, don't do it in our school. I said, why not? You're doing it in your own time with your own money. It's on a Saturday and weekends. They said, no, because they, then they'll pass comments. Now, that is the case of the institution actively working against the continuing professional development of, of teachers who choose to want to grow. Uh, in fact, there's a very specific question addressed to me about uh, the point that growth is inevitable, etc. I'm going to link all the three questions that have been asked about the academic staff college five years down the line and uh, how change is inevitable, etc. All these three things. Yesterday in CPD uh, think tank session, the same example about academic staff college was uh, brought up. We did discuss this particular question. In academic staff colleges, what happens is there cannot be any assessment. The reasons are very obvious. Now, the 21-day attendance in academic staff college course is some sort of obligatory so that I can get my next instrument uh, increment. Therefore, the motivation here is more instrumental and it's not integral at all. And when the motivation is instrumental, and what I need to produce at the end of 21 day course is my attendance certificate and there is no evaluation attached to it. I don't think even the academic staff colleges are uh, using a systematic evaluation, systematic assessment at the end of the 21 day course. This is, this is from experience. Second thing, most of the academic staff college courses, they are not uh, need based. They are not being made need-based. They are just the same courses that are being repeated. This is another unfortunate thing where assessment does not become really obligatory. These are, these are the things. Therefore, the professional development that is desired is not happening uh, in our system. This is one thing I would like to uh, say. Can I interrupt you? I, yes. if I, I don't mean to seem round, rude to you, but then are you not contradicting the point you are making? No. Uh, being inevitable if it's not happening. No, no, no that's not it. Um, the second question was, how do we visualize teachers five years down the line? This is a very interesting question. In fact, uh, after I got the question, I started thinking about it, particularly in the context of uh, India. Now, right now, if I look at uh, the, the profile of teachers in India, there is some sort of a divide between the rural and the urban where certain facilities, infrastructure facilities are available. There is scope for development given to one sector and the other sector is being deprived. I think this is fast disappearing. Our villages or the rural area, the rural sector is becoming aware of what is happening in the urban sector. And to help us, technology is coming in a big way. Uh, television certainly has played a major role. Therefore, since the rural sector teachers are becoming conscious of what is happening in the urban areas, there is going to be a larger interface and I think the professional, de professional development becomes uh, a natural process and the urge to develop professionally uh, becomes better. I think this is, this is my dream. This is my dream and I hope uh, it comes true. And the question about uh, 
the question that's asked by one of my old students is that when a child grows, the child is not conscious. But when a teacher grows professionally, can the teacher be as unconscious as the child is? I thought I made this point clear in my response. I'm not saying that one need to be unconscious about the professional development. One keeps growing and this growth has to be given a direction and this direction can be given through a process of reflection. That you grow in the sense, if you have taught for five years, you have obviously not, you have not been teaching the same way in the fifth year as you were teaching in the first year. If you are conscious of what you are doing, if you are conscious of the world outside, if you can think of how you can use your resources that are available to you outside and reflect on what you are doing to what others are doing, I think you do grow professionally and that becomes inevitable as well as a conscious process. That's, this is what I want to say. Thank um, you, Dr. Mahanraj. And um, I'd like to move the discussion on to Amal, who had a, a series of questions there also. Um, we're looking really at what should be assessed and evaluated. What kinds of things are we looking at specifically? Um, yeah, but uh, if you allow me, I'll just spend one minute in uh, sure. coming back to something very valuable that Nivedita raised in her question. Uh, we are definitely not creating an impression that it's a very easy process. Mm. I personally don't see a very big difference between development and learning. And both are emotionally challenging processes. They uh, force us to change, and change by definition means lots of challenges, emotional, physical, and all sorts of. So it's a difficult process. It requires efforts, it requires dedication, it requires motivation, inspiration, etc. The question that came to me about what uh, we assess in CPT. And the simple answer would be it's basically D that we are assessing in CPT, uh, assessing development. I, I would say that there are three broad aspects of that development. On the one hand, uh, what sort of learning has taken place? What sets of skills or knowledge that person has gained? That's one aspect. Another aspect would be what sort of change in thinking, in attitude, in behavior, in practice has come about as a result of that developmental process? And the third aspect would be what impact that change had on the classroom teaching, on the learning of students, on the institutional work and practices, etc. This is just a broad uh, outline. And as Rod very, uh, very well pointed out earlier, there is an institutional dimension to this and a personal individual dimension. Uh, the question that came to me also had a question, uh, had a uh, underlined word there, continuous. And I think that's also uh, a problem, but at the same time, a necessity. Uh, Quite a few of you have pointed out that there is some sort of voluntarism, some sort of personal initiative that should underline this process of development. My institute wants me to develop. That's one part of the story. I too want to develop. That's my personal desire. That's the second but even more important part of story. Because if I want to develop, I will try to develop. If I don't want to develop, I will follow all my institute's orders, but then still refuse to develop. But if I want to sustain my process of development, continuously I should be aware of what's happening to me. Am I growing? And if I realize that there are changes occurring to me, in other words, if I'm assessing and evaluating my own development, that gives me both a sense of direction where I'm heading for, and a measure of how far I have come and where I can go and what I can do and what, what I can't. So I think that that's my uh, take on it. This just links to a question I've just received um, from Darshana. Um, how can we assess what's happening within an individual? And uh, the answer is that, of course, um, we can't easily do it institutions um, very often have a system called appraisal 
uh, which many of you will be familiar with, and it sometimes goes together with the word performance. So performance appraisal on an annual basis where you meet with your manager, your line manager, and you have a conversation about everything you've uh, been up to over the last year and your plans for the next year. Um, that can be a trigger for development. This can be uh, a sharing of an individual development perspective which takes place between a representative of the institution and the individual. And I think if it's conducted in a non-judgmental and supportive way, it can really be an excellent track uh, for development. But it needs to be supportive and non-judgmental. Um, the manager concerned shouldn't be um, wielding authority um, and telling the individual what they should do to develop. Because ultimately, the answer to your question, Darshana, is um, we can't finally assess what's happening within an individual. It's the individual's responsibility to self-assess. And if the opportunity arises, for example, through appraisal, to share those insights about his or her own development with uh, a representative of the institution. Um, but no outsider can actually assess your development unless you're ready to share it with that outsider and the outsider may then give you useful feedback. I have a question here, actually two related questions. Uh, one person has said that uh, you mentioned evaluating pupils as one of the five things we, if we can evaluate as far as CPD is concerned. Have you tried doing this? If so, how? I ask this as it seems to be the most difficult thing to assess. And uh, another person, Ajay Kumar from Delhi, has uh, asked if the teacher only, uh, if students uh, could assess, why not take regular feedback from students? I want to make a distinction here. We're not talking about taking feedback from students. We're talking about student learning. Uh, and, and we have done this. Uh, we have, uh, when we've done whole school uh, intervention and whole school improvement work with uh, the low cost private schools or affordable private schools as they're called, we have actually uh, assessed student learning before we began and we've been able to uh, f uh, find out what their le learning levels are in language and uh, in mathematics, say for grade 3 and grade 5. And then we, we are able to assess what are the weak areas, what are the conceptual uh, areas of weakness and so uh, what are the areas of conceptual weakness. Based on that, we've actually done an assessment of stu teachers also uh, and it, uh, they, uh, they, they volunteered to take it and we found that the teachers were making the same mistakes and we helped them reflect on so what is happening because teachers don't even think about if children are not performing, they assume the child is not doing well. So we needed to help them examine where the child is going wrong and why the child is going wrong because it could be, it could be stemming from the teacher. And based on that, we actually did, uh, uh, did uh, provide some need-based uh, uh, support and training programs, after which we did a midline assessment of students and teachers as well as an end line. And we show, saw a marked improvement. And the assessments for students were done by an external party. So it wasn't we ourselves doing it. So we were able to show them progress of the students. And through seeing progress of the students, that's a huge impetus for teachers to say, OK, now I, need to, uh, now I know what has to be done. So, yeah. uh, here is another question addressed to me about professional development and teacher development. Uh, I'd like to respond to this. One has career itself as the focus. The other one is becoming just a successful person. Now, this is something that we have to think. Am I being true to myself or I don't care what others think about me as long as I, I am considered, I am recognized as a successful teacher. What is my ultimate goal? This decides whether we are developing professionally or whether simply developing in our own career. Now there is, um, this is a principle taken from economics. This is called Peter's principle. It says that each one of us can rise to the level of our incompetence not competence. We can rise to the level of our incompetence. So somebody who is capable of teaching only at the primary school perhaps cannot become a teacher at the secondary school, but that's the ceiling of his or her incompetence. This is how Peter's principle describes this whole process. I think professional development 
also has exactly the same underlying principle in it. If I want to grow, <coughs> if I can cross the barrier of my incompetence, if I can reflect on what I am doing, if I become aware of my weaknesses, it's possible for me to grow. Unless I become aware of my weakness, I cannot grow. This is how I see professional development. It has to be a bottom-up process. It cannot be. It cannot really be a top-down process. It has to be a bottom-up process. The trigger, the trigger that I need to develop should be from within me. Only then professional development can take place. Um, if it happens, then each one of us become accountable. If it's a bottom-up process, we become accountable for our own development. If it is top-down process, it is facilitated. And since it is facilitated, we may take it, we may not take it at all. This is something that we have to um, ask ourselves. And three very, very important elements of uh, a professional development are, it can be put in the form of an acronym ASK. Do I have the right attitude? Do I have the essential skills? Do I have the necessary thirst to develop the knowledge that's required to understand these skills, to put these skills in practice, and the right type of attitude to use them when they are needed? That, in a large way, summarizes uh, CPD and the question that, that's been asked to me, what is professional development? Thank you. That links quite nicely to Rod's next set of questions, which are about, which are about institutional role. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast, and we're not going to be able to get to all of them, just so you know. If you're getting a bit antsy that your question hasn't come up, it might not. I'm um, also, after Rod speaks, I'd like to come back to the audience and ask uh, some more people to volunteer oral questions. Thank you. Rod. Thanks very much. Um, what are the external factors that affect CPD? Um, and it says here, it's a very strict order, this is from... Uh, Gagan Kanna from Punjab, suggest solutions. Okay, um, well, th let me just uh, very quickly say what the main external factors are that um, affect CPD in an individual. Um, first of all, uh, change, the inevitability of change, which several people have uh, commented on. Change presents an opportunity for development. Uh, you take it or you leave it. Um, the uh, climate and the policies within an institution um, and I just want to make, I'm going to risk a comment on the Indian context here without being um, an insider. I think I'm um, a partly informed, maybe badly informed outsider. Um, it seems to me that um, at policy level, uh, there is a shift going on in India at the moment. Um, there's a shift going on in terms of how uh, national bodies view um, the process of CPD. Um, and there's also a shift in attitude towards teachers. I've heard several times that um, public uh, state school teachers uh, within India are getting better paid. And there is a, um, an old adage which says that society gets the teachers it deserves. Um, and if uh, a particular society values its teachers, and that means also paying them decently and giving them decent conditions of work, um, the chances of development are greater. But it does seem to me within India that the sticking point is very often at institutional level where um, school principals are more concerned with the administrative realities of a day-to-day -day, uh, nature than they are with uh, the longer-term view of the development of their staff. Um, and there are a lot of school principals within India, and I've had this story several times even in the last 24 hours, who... Um, are not developmentally oriented. They're so fixated on solving the day-to-day -day problems within an institution that they're incapable of projecting a vision, a developmental vision for the institution. This is a, a huge factor which influences development um, in the individuals and in institutions. The third factor which influences development is colleagues. Um, and if you have a sharing mentality within your institution, if you have a group of colleagues who are like-minded and who are prepared to share ideas and prepared to open up their classroom doors uh, to other colleagues so that you can mutually observe what's going on in your classrooms. Um, 
it's very likely that development can take place. These, it seems to me, are the factors linking to that. And sorry, this is a little bit longer, but I'll be as quick as I can. Um, there's a, a very nicely phrased question. Um, from what I hear about CPD, I get a sense that for CPD to work well, the role played by the institution is paramount. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a huge body of literature that talks about communities of practice that represent self-motivated initiatives to develop and grow. Do you think there can be a fit between the two? This is from Vijay Krishna. Thank you, Vijay. Um, of course there can be a fit between the two. Um, an institution which is developmentally oriented and which is led by a principle with real educational vision can provide for the development of the individual members of staff within that institution. And it's a great pity we haven't got our colleague uh, Sulaba Natraj with us here today uh, because she's one of the think tank members and she uh, is principal at Waymade, um, the uh, Inst College of Education, which has a very enlightened development policy and I'd like uh, to cite that as a typical example of an institution that's developing with communities of practice working within the institution. So thank you for those two questions, which I think have brought us on. And back over to you, Alan. Thank you. Um, I've got an interesting one here. We're uh, Rashid uh, Nehal, I think it is, uh, from... There, there, Alan, there are two questions that uh, have come to me. Would you like me to answer them? Uh, sure, yeah. Why don't yep. you go ahead? Uh, I would just uh, like to uh, say one, just one sentence in addition to what Rod had said. I would say not only can there be a fit between institutional and individual uh, perspectives, but I would say the word should is more appropriate. We, there should be a fit between the institutional and individual uh, perspectives on CPD. One question that's from Nivedita, shouldn't assessing how CPD takes place be a more important part to add to the theory, the processes which will inform practice? Uh, I, I'm not sure about the assessing part of that, but definitely a better understanding of how CPD takes place, what processes are involved, how a novice teacher gradually develops into an expert professional. Expert is a strong word, a loaded word, but how a beginner teacher grows into an experienced teacher with a lot more professionalism. It's, we are still not very clear about all the processes and complexities involved therein, but an understanding of that process will be definitely a huge advantage to build up a theory of CPD. I, I'm not sure how far it's important to assess those processes. But in relation to assessment, there's another question. Uh, a gentleman wants to know how can we evaluate development of teachers? One or two concrete examples, please. Uh, I, I think I'll give just one example. There is one superficial way of measuring that development. You observe a teacher's talking time in the classroom how much the teacher talks in the classroom now and let's say two years later, assuming that teacher's talk time has something to do with his presence and attitude and approach to teaching. And that difference tells you whether that teacher has changed or not. And then there is a risk. We might automatically risk change with development, but I'm just trying to give a simplistic example. But then there are also other ways which go much deeper. You record that teacher's interaction with students in the classroom today. And then we believe that the teacher has undergone some development in two years. And two years later, you again record another instance of that teacher interacting with students. And then you compare the two interactions in terms of, for example, the teacher's approach to student questions, the teachers being supportive to their curiosity, the kinds of words the teacher uses, the kinds of support the teacher provides to the students. And if we notice some change, some positive change, then that gives us an indication that some development has definitely taken place. So I believe those examples are helpful. Thank you.
just going to grab this and disagree with Amol very quickly about the question of teacher talking time. Um, it's not about um, quantity of talk, it's about quality of talk. Um, and there are some very good reasons sometimes why teachers talk a lot in the classroom. Um, and as long as that's good quality talk and the decision is taken for the right reason, um, I would just guard against using teacher talking time as a measure of development. So sorry, Amal, to disagree. Yeah, yeah, can, okay. Can I move this on, to, because you've introduced quite nicely some, a concrete example of what you can do to assess teaching practice and an individual teacher's development. Um, we, we've, it's related to a question that's been asked by Rashid Nehal, uh, saying that a set, uh, teachers in universities and colleges in India are assessed based on their published work rather than their teaching. And she appears to think that that is not an appropriate thing to do. They should be based more on their teaching rather than their publishing. What do you think are appropriate ways of assessing specific instances of teacher development? Can you give us a concrete example? Uh, if you allow, can I take the lead? Because I, I, uh, my presentation uh, on the first day was specifically on this issue. The whole system called academic performance indicators introduced by UGC for, the, uh, for assessing uh, teacher performance in higher education institutions. Uh, I personally feel that it's a good beginning made because for the first time UGC has started looking at teachers growth, teachers development in a broader sense. Published work is just a part of the whole process. So if a teacher has to uh, earn a score of let's say 200 points in a certain number of years, published work will be a part of that. But then there are other things like attending seminars and conferences, uh, contributing to the administrative and management work of the institution, uh, presenting, then uh, undertaking research projects, etc., etc. There are still lots of huge issues there, and uh, quality is still not anywhere on the horizon. It's all uh, almost entirely quantitative assessment at the cost of quality, but still the positive part of that is uh, it's not just teaching as measured by the examination results of learners, which was the practice about uh, 30 years ago. That's a positive change. So uh, the point Rashid Nehal is raising is teachers are judged by their publications and not by their, their teaching. I would only say that this is a swing going to the opposite direction and it needs to be corrected. The earlier uh, performance assessment was purely on the basis of student performance and other aspects of development were not considered. Now we have a very detailed elaborate system of development but the student performance and the impact of teaching is not in the consideration. So probably the swing is in the opposite direction. Just to add to what Amol has said, there's also one more measure, uh, student assessment of teacher performance. A grid has been developed by the University Grants Commission. Uh, that also goes into assessing the uh, teacher performance and goes into API. That's also yeah, for, uh, for, for, for the promotions. It's, it's included now as part of API. API stands for uh, uh, as, uh, annual performance indicator. Just to add to that very quickly, um, there are lots of teachers who are brilliant teachers, but they don't um, have the ability to articulate what it is that makes their teaching brilliant. Um, and very often, um, teaching is spoken about as an art or as some kind of magic. And Martha Pennington writes about this in a very good paper in uh, Richards and Noonan's Second Language Teacher Education. One of the ways in which um, we become more professional and develop professionally is by being able to articulate what it is that we do um, in terms of the beliefs and principles which underlie what we do. In other words, to understand why we do what we do as teachers and not just to rely on a view of teaching as some kind of magic, some kind of um, intuitively guided magic. Um, and if it sometimes takes a publication or a conference presentation to do that, so much the better. 
Um, one of the benefits of presenting your ideas in publication or in a conference presentation is that you're working much at a much deeper level of understanding what makes your teaching what it is when you do this um, than if you just go on teaching by magic. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I think Rod is right and as, I, I, as well as Amol and Dr. Mohan Raj about, uh, because they've been talking, they're looking at, prime, at higher education, but if you're looking at the, at the school sector, I think if you're looking at continuing professional development and if a teacher is growing and developing, there must be change in her practice in the classroom because uh, she or he is primarily a classroom teacher. They may publish, they may uh, uh, write journals, write articles, of course, and those are all indicators of development. But I think the te a practicing teacher in the classroom must be teaching better and her, her, her practice in the classroom has to be far more positive uh, as far as the school sector is concerned. Can I open this up to the audience then, get some more oral questions before we finish? There was one at the back there. Um, the gentleman at the front has been trying to ask a question for a long time. Uh, one over there, yes. The guy in the maroon turban in the middle, yep. Uh, Anil, yeah, carry on. My question Sorry. is on the largest teacher preparation program in the country, and that is the B.Ed. courses. And uh, this, I have been troubled by these courses because I have evaluated them in my research work earlier. And there has been kind of theoretical change in the outline and the courses that are now being offered uh, as B.Ed. And each teacher in India has to mandatorily take these courses. However, I see there is a lot of gap uh, between theory and practice. I mean, these courses are supposed to prepare the teachers who will be teaching at the schools in India. But if you look at the teacher performance and the results that are there in the schools of India, we are saying that uh, students are not doing well at all. And we are all concerned about the quality of students in our schools in India. So I want to have some suggestions how this gap can be bridged. Hello, good morning. I'm okay. Pratap Kumar uh, Samantha Singh. Uh, uh, from ALJ Odisha. We've been organizing teacher training programs for pretty long years. If I give a very general statement, uh, the trainees, 80% trainees, they don't come back to us in any form if you talk about volunteer uh, professional development. Right in the training program, 20% of them, they somehow look very much enthusiastic and they come back later. On. So, what we are fighting is attitudinal problem, program, problems. Can I Attitudes. stop you there? Are you fighting an attitudinal problem? Uh, yes. Or is it a problem with the content of the training courses? Uh, not exactly. Is we, the content we... of the training courses meeting the needs of those teachers? Because uh, we're talking about CPD here, which generally is not all about training. Yeah? It's about activities that take place in the school, in the classroom, on the ground, not when you're removed from the class, in the classroom, not when you're removed from the classroom and put into a training room. See, training can be one small part of activities that uh, people take, people do as part of their own professional development. But if it's mandatory and they're supposed to go there and it's planned by an institution and everybody has to do it, it's probably not going to affect them a great deal. And if they're not coming back to it, it suggests that they didn't particularly like it the first time around, and they don't see any reason to it. Well, there are factors, of course, but my, my question is very, uh, of course, mm. exactly we are talking about professional development. Uh, we are not talking about the holistic individual development. And the question is, I am much inspired by Professor Monra's uh, child's letter to the father. So the life skill, the whole attitude, the commitment of the individual, probably we are talking less about it. And there lies if an individual he is holistically developed, much committed, much of our labor will be saved, mm. and the teacher training in India will be successful. Thank you. I think uh, the panel will comment later on. Uh, we are talking too much on professional development only, probably not talking more about the holistic individual development. For the convenience of this panel discussion, we have chosen to focus on one aspect. Mm. But as we know, 
all the processes of learning, growth, development, personal, professional are so intertwined, so mixed up with each other that in reality they are inseparable. So it's a matter of convenience that at, we, we are focusing on one aspect but we don't want to give an impression that professional development is away or out of holistic development. But at the same time we would like to remind you that professional development is an integral component of holistic development as well. Hello. But I'd also like to, to emphasize that point that I was making was that you might think that they're not coming back because of their personal attitude, but actually it might be something that's wrong with the training. If it's lecture based and boring, why would I want to go back to it? So have a look at what the content of the training is and what the aims of the training were before deciding that the teachers have bad attitudes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, carry on. <coughs> My question is to Rod. Uh, you disagreed with uh, Amol when he said the teacher talk time. You said it doesn't matter that actually the quantity, it's quality. But my problem is, I'm of course talking about the school, uh, school context. I, I agree with Amol rather, disagree with you. It really matters that teacher's talk time should be lesser as it develops. You know, uh, we, I, as an English teacher in the classroom, what we see, if teacher is really a quality speaker, that's really a dangerous thing actually because he speaks loud and doesn't provide a chance to the students to speak. And that's been happening in our classroom. I would like to have your uh, reaction on that, buddy. Thank you very much. You caught, you caught me. Um, absolutely right. And may I say that you are one of those people who speaks in a quality way because you made your point very, very well. Um, yeah, I, d uh, I don't want to be misunderstood here. Um, what I said in response to Amal was that it would be um, a dangerous measure of professional development simply to rely on quantitative measures when it comes to teacher talking time. Um, we need to look beyond the quantity and we need to look at the quality as mm. well. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, there are many teachers who speak perfect English um, or nearly perfect English and they get all the practice in the classroom. And the poor students who are lousy at English get no practice at all. Um, mm. So you're absolutely right. Um, there is a need to cut down on teacher talking time in many Indian classrooms, and not only Indian classrooms, um, but it shouldn't be the only measure of development. That was my point. But thank you for uh, mm. pushing me to answer that. And John Matthews made a similar uh, comment on his question, which is it's about student talking time, not teacher talking time. So, um, we've got five minutes left. Um, I, we've had a request for the panel to recommend any particular uh, books on CPD that people can go away and read after the conference. So if you can think of one key resource that you think would be useful for people to look at, or could just be an article rather than a book that you think would be worth looking at. And I'll ask you at the end of the discussion, just to wrap up, and we can leave that with people. They can take it away and do their own professional development by searching for those volumes and reading them. We've got a whole bunch of hands up, somebody desperately at the back. There's a guy down at the front here, and one, uh, one or two over in the middle. So let's Alex, take those for starters. One, respond to Anil Sarwal's question. Sorry, where? Anil Sarwal had a, Dr. Anil Sarwal. Anil Sarwal. He had a question about theory and practice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, if you want to uh, quickly this answer is a question. That. Yeah, this Please. is in response to Dr. <laughs> Anil Sarwal, who raised a question on uh, theory and practice and the beard thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder if it is within the scope of this panel discussion. However, I would just like to say one thing. National Curriculum Framework for Teacher Education 2010 has made attempts at this. There is a, There has been a revision of teacher education curriculum both at the bachelor's as well as the master's degree uh, it's being discussed and a lot of training is happening as to how to bridge the gap between theory and practice I, I was, since it's not within the scope of this maybe we could discuss this uh, later okay back to the audience please um sorry we had number one over here number two there and number three up the back thanks good morning everybody i'm nagendra from eflu we all have come here to grow professionally. My question is, in what ways can we sustain this concept CPD? Could you please explain that? Thank you. 
Can I just add to that? We've had um, questions about how do we sustain CPD, but also how do we um, enable CPD to happen in across big systems like the state school systems in rural areas where people don't have any access to resources? I'm trying to answer the question that Alan posed as well as the gentleman out there. How can we sustain CPD? I think uh, when, when you're looking at CPD, um, especially in, in the context of a large country like India or even a large state, I think you have to look at the personal, you, you will have to look at the organizational in terms of all the institutions as well as policy. So there, uh, there has to be a seamless uh, link between the personal, the professional, uh, personal, organizational and policy. So policies have to be uh, positive, pragmatic as well as uh, developmental and innovative. Institutions have to be supported in order to be able to uh, encourage in innovative practice and then teachers have to be enabled so that they continue the uh, innovative practice in order that children are learning. So I think you have to be looking at policy. The policies are changing, but institutions and organizations are not changing fast enough. And finally, the individual needs uh, or the personal, uh, the, the teacher as a person has to change also. So I think one has to see the connection between the personal profession, uh, organizational and policy. I would say that's how you could look at large systems perhaps changing. Policies are changing, but the trouble is that we, we look, we're actively trying to resist the policy changes rather than saying, okay, this is good, this is a good idea, so how do we ensure now organizations can change, the, individual, the schools can change, and therefore the individuals in the schools? Yeah, I think uh, uh, in addition to a very valuable point Maya has just made, it has to be uh, a bottom-up initiative of individual teachers matched by top-down support of the system and the policies. But in addition to that, there's another thing that I consider very important for sustaining development. It's a stressful process, and it also needs lots of support. In this case, small support groups like teachers' clubs and larger groups like teachers' professional associations are very, very helpful. Because uh, as we have come to realize in our CPD think tank, Professional development is an individual process, but it thrives in a community. It needs a community to sustain it. It can be a small group like a teacher club or a large group like uh, a professional association. I personally feel that it's even more useful to be simultaneously part, be a part of several of networks, a small personal group up to a global electronic network. Mm. And I think that adds to the sustainability of your efforts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time and I'm not going to be able to take any more questions. Uh, okay, last one, because you did book it earlier on. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Respected uh, man of letters and of course the exponents. I've been overwhelmed uh, throughout this discussion of CPD. Uh, Tribetide questions I'd like to throw to you, especially, you see, uh, the CPD is inevitable uh, measures and, uh, you know, a certain infrastructural development to be counted and finally you see teaching is a noble profession of course we, we jumped into this profession uh, but I'm so sorry to say everything is counted in India and of course in a broad and entire world with pecuniary benefit so uh, uh, some way it's been uh, you know teachers have found nagging and uh, of course buzzing around what are the benefits lying about and uh, how should I be so spontaneous uh, that's all about if it is to be justified. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, just to finish off, can we have one uh, recommendation, one recommended, recommended reading to take away? I think I'll start, Maya. Let me start because uh, there's a the reason. Uh, we have prepared a small annotated bibliography on CPD. And I believe that that's one resource where you have uh, this was course of books and articles and important uh, reports on CPD, research studies, etc., with annotations included therein. That has been published by British Council. I suspect a few copies might be available somewhere around, but don't worry, it's soon going to be put up on uh, British Council website where it will be accessible free. Yes. And then uh, I'm sure other panelists will be pointing out some specific uh, examples to start with for you and you will find the link in the bibliography.
Thanks, Samuel. Yeah, I'd like to endorse Samuel's um, uh, comments about the bibliography. It's really worth having, so do make sure that you uh, make a note of it and get a copy. My recommendation is a book which um, was published some years ago, and um, I'm going to say this with due modesty by an ex-student of mine um, called uh, Apple, Joachim Apple, um, and the book is called Diary of a Language Teacher. Um, it's a perfect example of uh, how diary keeping and reflecting through writing can um, be beneficial developmentally. What he does in this book is to track through um, a year of his work with difficult teenagers in a secondary school in Germany um, and he writes notes on his own uh, reflections on that process. It's very, very readable. Um, and I recommend it to you highly. It's called Diary of a Language Teacher by Joachim, J-O-A-C-H-I-M, Apple, A-P-P-E-L. Uh, with Alan's permission, I'll mention two books, and they are at two extreme ends. The first book I would refer to is one of the earliest books that got published in this area. This is by Richards and Farrell on professional development. Uh, recently, I've been reading a book which was published in 2011, this is written by somebody, I, I do not know if uh, the name is properly pronounced, Fioni. This is the name of the person and this book is published by uh, Pearson, Pearson, uh, Longman Pearson. And this is a book which has a series of worksheets and tasks and if you are interested in uh, doing a course on professional development, this is an extremely helpful book. It's called um, Worksheets for Professional Development. I think what Amul said, that anthology of, uh, you know, I think you'll be able to see a, a lot of useful readings in that uh, compilation. Apart from that, long time ago, I had read a book, I think the name is Teacher's Work by Sandra Acker. I found that a very, very humanistic sort of book. It's about lives of teachers and, and I think uh, it, it's an ethnographic study uh, by somebody called Sandra Acker. And, uh, I would recommend that for anybody who wants to understand and get into the psyche of a teacher. Thank you. If you want a copy of the bibliography on continuous professional development, it looks like this and is available on the British Council stand. I've, ex I've told them to expect a stampede. There's also a book published by the British Council and IATEFL called Teacher Development and Education in Context which is a very useful book for, uh, for reading up more about CPD. So start your continuing professional journey by picking up copies of these and finding more resources to find out more about assessing and evaluating continuous professional development. Thank you very much for all your questions. I've got a book full of them here. Uh, we've also had quite a, a strong Twitter feed on this event, so thank you very much for that. I'd like to present our guests with an a token of our appreciation and thank you very much for being such an active audience. Mm -hmm.